Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to today's event. We see publishers, writers, CMOs, some government representatives on today's call and a very particularly warm welcome to those of you who are first time guests. For those people, ICMP by way of intro is the global trade body for the music publishing industry. We represent major and independent music publishers worldwide and 64 different national trade associations on six continents. This digital series has seen more than 1,500 people now attend in recent episodes, and uh, that's been an enormous success, and we look forward to another great event today. I particularly want to thank our ICMP colleague, Alex Black, Chief Executive Officer at Sonaton Music for the licensed music we've just heard. The track in particular was called Lawless and was written by Andrew Potterton and Andrew Thompson. So uh, welcome everyone and some housekeeping rules, if I may, uh, for today's event or some guides to the discussion before we get started. Uh, today we have outstanding series of speakers who will talk about music, data, systems and some developments in the area of collective management. It is, however, uh, not to be just a one way conversation. Uh, it will be a discussion and we really encourage everyone to get involved in that discussion. And very simply, you can do that, uh, not just by the chat box with each other as attendees, but principally with the Q&A box. Uh, all very straightforward, but you will see in the center uh, bottom of your screen, a specific Q&A box whereby you can ask questions of the panelists. When you do ask your question, what we will do is we will seek to unmute uh, you from your mic option so that you can ask that question live uh, to the uh, panelists themselves. If that doesn't work, our moderator today will read out the question itself and we'll get that answered uh, at the tail end of the presentations. All of the ICMP staff are present here on today's call, uh, very familiar to most people on today's call, and they can be contacted for anything you need in terms of access details or questions, usual details on the screen and uh, by email. So that's the uh, housekeeping. Uh, by way of context setting, today's music industry, which ICMP members invest in and license, involves approximately 100 million tracks today. That includes tens of millions of production music works, such as those we've just heard. And it's to a global, global audience today of billions. Music is licensed to more than 800 different DSPs worldwide, tens of thousands of TV and radio broadcasters, licensed to gaming, print, hard copy, and of course live, of which we're all working to ensure a safe resurgence soon. Metadata, is the crucial gear in the music industry's engine. And it's what drives the licensing of these 100 million works and also how right holders and creators are paid. Collective licensing is one of the vehicles of how this vast catalog is delivered. It's an ever evolving space, of course. And on today's event, we have frankly some of the finest minds in the world's industry to give their perspective on latest developments. So with no further ado, I would just like to introduce them. We have Drew Dillis, Chief Operating Officer at Orpheum and Michael Pitoglu, Chief, or excuse me, Product Manager at Orpheum. Drew's a specialist in economics and law. He's a leading expert in digital music rights and intellectual property and co-founder of Orpheum. Michael's a technical and product suite specialist working directly with Orpheum's executive leadership. And the company sets itself up to provide end-to-end -end applications to power the digital supply chain and monetization system. They spoke in our previous event about the importance of database administration, modern methods of ingesting and administering flawless metadata in order to ensure right holders and creators are paid for their work. And we look forward to hearing more from them today about the front end side of their business. Also joining us, we have Cécile Rappé-Weber. Uh, Cécile, of course, is very familiar to everyone across our industry as Executive Director of Licensing International and Operations at SASEM. Cécile is frankly one of the finest minds out there when it comes to intellectual property, entertainment law, and of course, the collective management of music. Sassem is an industry leader and direct industry colleague, and we're really looking forward to hearing more from Cecile today about their priorities at Sassem and some insight on the state of the industry. We're also joined uh, again, if I may say, by Chris Arendt and Richard Thompson. Chris, of course, is Chief Executive Officer. Uh, Richard is Chief Information Officer at the Mechanical Licensing Collective based in Nashville, USA. The MLC's mission is synonymous with that of music publishing. That is to ensure songwriters, composers, lyricists, and music publishers receive their mechanical royalties from streaming and download services accurately and on time. The MLC is at the forefront of change in the digital licensing space, thanks to the recently passed Music Modernization Act, of which our colleagues at the NMPA fought so hard and tenaciously to achieve in the benefit of publishers, songwriters, and composers. 
We will also be joined today, of course, by Lucy Caswell. Lucy is General Manager and Chief Policy Officer uh, at our UK Trade Association, the MPA. Lucy is a highly valued colleague of ICMP and she'll be leading today's discussion. Very familiar with all of the issues, regulatory, commercial, in and around collective licensing and metadata. And with no further ado, Lucy, I pass the floor to you. Thank you, Johnny. Welcome everyone. Um, and thank you uh, to the ICMP team for putting this together, putting this fantastic panel together and having me along for the ride as well. Um, thank you to everyone who's attending and who attended uh, part one of this great series. Um, we'll have a, a little recap probably in some of the things that uh, people are saying, but last time there was a great focus on data um, and we're going to move along from that conversation around data to something it also is, it's innovation. Um, you know, how is this uh, ecosystem of rights management moving with the times? Who's moving with it? Who's rising to the challenges? And, and frankly, what are they? So I'm going to pass over to uh, the guys that Johnny's introduced here um, to tell you a little bit more about what they're doing and why, and where perhaps they've got to since the last uh, conversations uh, around this screen. So in turn, um, probably starting with one of the the most known of late change makers, uh, the MLC. If you'd like to each just take, say, five minutes to give everyone some context on, on who you are and what you're doing, that would be great. Thank you. I'm the CEO of the MLC. Um, it's great to be here. And um, thank you, John, and um, all of the folks at ICMP for um, being such great supporters of, of us. Um, it has been challenging to build an organization from scratch over the last 18 months um, and spread the word globally about what we do and how it impacts all of you. And the pandemic certainly didn't make that any easier, but, um, but the support that ICMP has given us has certainly helped uh, us to bridge that divide. And uh, I think we have succeeded in at least getting up on the radar for most people. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to share uh, my screen and just run very quickly through a small number of slides uh, just to make sure that uh, everyone on the webinar today um, understands who we are and what we do, and then we'll um, be able to fill in some of the gaps during the conversation. Lucy, are you able to see my screen? Wonderful. Thanks. So um, the MLC um, is a new collective management organization that sits between uh, the digital audio services that operate in the United States and then um, uh, anyone who is entitled to receive mechanical royalties, no doubt many if not most of you or your organizations. Um, one interesting note about the MLC, particularly given the trends um, that have uh, been uh, taking place in Europe, um, where you are seeing increased competition in the CMO space. We are the exclusive administrator in the United States for these rights that are covered by a newly established blanket license that was established when the Music Modernization Act was passed. And so the MLC is the only organization that can collect and distribute the mechanical royalties that are paid pursuant to those new blanket licenses. So sort of interesting and perhaps ironic that um, Europe is moving toward more competition in the CMO space at the same time that the U.S. has essentially established an exclusive administrator. Um, <clears throat> membership in the MLC is free, and uh, one of the unique aspects of, of, of our operations are that under the federal law um, that was passed, the digital services that operate in this digital audio space in the U.S. are required to pay an assessment that covers 100% of the MLC's operating costs. That allows the MLC to distribute 100% of the royalties that we receive to rights holders without deducting any administration fees. Um, that is certainly um, innovative and we believe unique among CMOs globally. Um, membership um, for those rights holders that wish to um, uh, join us uh, is easy. You go to our website and uh, click on the button, the top right side of it in blue that says connect to collect. That's the tagline that we've developed for um, uh, membership. And uh, it's how you connect with us in order to collect your mechanical royalties from the US market. Again, related to those digital audio uses. <clears throat> um, in addition, um, one of the 
the uh, other innovations that the law has driven is um, the MLC's uh, requirement to establish and maintain a public database of musical works ownership information. Um, that database uh, launched publicly um, right before the beginning of this year. Um, if you click on the yellow button on our homepage that says public search, you are then taken to a search screen where you can plug in um, uh, the name of any work that you know of and see if we have any data in our database for that work. Um, on the left, you see some of the data points that you can um, access in the database today. And certainly over time, we'll be adding more data um, to the database. Uh, but again, this is free and it's publicly available for anyone in the world to search and access. Uh, in addition, uh, we also make our data available in bulk, um, another innovation. So for any organization or sophisticated individual out there who is interested in doing so, you can um, essentially um, sign up for a subscription with us um, for a, a whopping $100 uh, US. You get the, um, the setup and then the first month of weekly snapshots and thereafter for $25 a month, you can uh, continue to receive weekly snapshots of all of the ownership data in our database um, in its entirety. And um, that is also um, a pretty new development. We know that dozens of organizations have already done this. And so our data is being widely accessed by organizations around the world um, already. Um, we've launched a really innovative data quality initiative. Um, in, in simple terms, it is a tool that allows rights holders to compare uh, their data um, from their systems with the data in our systems and, uh, and then receive a report that identifies the discrepancies between the two. Um, we've had more than 500 organizations and individuals participate already, and those organizations um, and individuals have compared more than 20 million works. Some of that um, uh, represents um, shares of the same work. So that is not 20 million unique works, um, but the unique work count is now, I think, approaching 10 million. So um, we have done quite a few data comparisons and, um, and in that way helped uh, a number of rights holders improve the quality of their data um, substantially. There is more information about this program and some webinars that we have filmed um, that are available on our website if you wish to learn more about that. So um, at a high level, that's a little bit about the MLC. And uh, Lucy, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you very much. That was amazingly potted. So it was very cool. Um, so we've heard a lot about the, uh, the complexity of the data or trying to improve the efficiencies around that, the access to that, but also unique works um, and the quality of that data absolutely uh, an area that Orpheum are working in, working to improve and working to manage. Um, so I wonder if uh, Drew or Michael, you could give us your five minutes of telling us where you're at as a company in this space. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, Orpheum is a technology business um, that specializes in building software that helps rights holders maximize the commercial value of their IP. Uh, we offer solutions uh, across or for catalog management, licensing, matching, UGC monetization, royalty allocations and distributions, uh, reportings, and analytics. Um, and over the last year and a half, we've really been focusing on a specific area uh, for CMOs and, and building a suite of products to help CMOs um, kind of modernize and catch, keep up with the, the, the current demands uh, to effectively operate um, collective management organizations. Just just like that, that make it sound simple, Drew. Thank you. Um, now, in, in the in the world of uh, complexity, um, Ceci and, and I know very well how the, the licensing that goes alongside all these rights can be very complex, but there are huge strides uh, happening with PROs, with rights holders, to both streamline that process and uh, to work with companies uh, such as they're here today um, and to really evolve that landscape in data and, and licensing. So at, at the front running of that, Cecile, I wonder if you could tell us uh, where Sassen is at. So oh, that's not very good for women because uh, you're very young companies and actually for women, uh, we just born in 1851, so I feel very old compared to you. 
But uh, so actually, Sassem, you know, is a French musical CMO, uh, but also handles dubbing and subtitle, which with the development of the SVOD platforms is super important, comedy show and director of musical content and TV shows. So we are not only focused on musical, but audiovisual as well. And uh, what is also important is that you know us as a CMO in France, which deal on a blanket license for all the repertoire. But we also have affiliate in Monaco, Lebanon, in Luxembourg, uh, in Polynesia. And uh, we are the second repertoire in the world after the Anglo-American one, thanks to our members that are coming from Africa, Middle East, Brazil, very big act in Brazil, uh, Egypt, and uh, many other countries. So um, we have developed, of course, the usual traditional business of the CMO, but it's true that uh, now, since uh, 2008, we had uh, the uh, amazing opportunity to uh, set up a partnership with Universal Music Publishing for Deal, uh, which allows us to um, handle the online rights of uh, UMPG uh, with the Sassen repertoire. And uh, since uh, 2008, uh, we've been able also to attract other uh, partners such as uh, Wixen Publishing, Warner Chapel, Wise Music, more recently Impel, and some other ones. So it's true that now, uh, thanks to that uh, leadership, we, we are like a very important hub in Europe. And so we have to ingest all these massive data coming from uh, all the different uh, DSPs. Uh, actually, uh, I joined Sassem in uh, 2013, and the first deal I have to, be, to, to, to manage was the first multi-territorial deal with YouTube, covering 130 countries, dealing with the music content and the non-music content called general entertainment, with a company that I must say is not super always transparent when it comes to data. So I really uh, immediately understand um, the uh, issue with the ingestion of data the importance of getting the documentation registered as soon as possible in the process of the online to cover all the different countries. Uh, and uh, immediately, I, I really feel that we must implement a lot of business analysis, uh, you know, business intelligence analysis, because we will have to run a business that it now is worldwide. And you cannot just, you know, say, OK, I received the revenue and that's all. Uh, compared to uh, United States, where uh, Chris was mentioning uh, uh, is a monopoly uh, in <laughs> for once in United States, uh, it's true that there is the fragmentation of rights in Europe, which means that you must receive all the DSR, you must identify your works in these billions of lines to invoice the, um, the, 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 the platform and then to get your revenue. And it's true that uh, it's very, very difficult when you see the development of this international platform that now are present in mo more than 250 countries when you have to receive all the exploitation from India, for instance. So we had, we were forced very soon and really thanks to our Anglo-American partners uh, that really export their repertoire even more than SASM, even if we are a very important uh, uh, repertoire in the world, we, we were forced to invest in technology. And uh, I'm, I'm very uh, happy because my, my friend from Orfima are there because we, we had a presentation very recently, uh, very impressive of, our, of their technology. It's true that nowadays we have the chance in a traditional business, uh, such as the CMOs one, to now have partners that uh, present new technology and that we must work with this tech company to improve our services. And so I will come back, but thanks to that, we have developed uh, you know, um, an initiative called Elixir to match and link the ISWC with the RSCs to improve uh, the uh, matching you know, uh, for, the, uh, for the invoicing. We have developed your rights platform with IBM that we now really process uh, uh, all the D DSR. And uh, when I joined, it was about 25 millions of revenue. Now it's 300 millions 
in seven years, 300 millions of revenue just for SASM. And uh, it means that uh, we have to process billion and billion of data to do some uh, business intelligence analysis. And of course, to work in um, mutualization with all the CMOs of the different tools. Uh, we will maybe uh, have a come back to that, but it's true that there is, a, uh, within CISAC, some initiative within Fast Track as well to develop common tools for the community of the CMOs, such as the ISWC um, allocation, the right holder access for the documentation, many things that, of course, uh, are very important for the publisher and all the attendees of the panel today. Absolutely. Thank you for raising so many points there and, and so well as well. And the technology leads us into answering one point that's already been raised, which is about um, efficiencies. Um, but you also raised the points of the, the volume of data, interoperability of that data and recognition, um, and then, of course, just the capabilities to manage it. But also, I, I suppose that technology needs to point in the right direction of uh, usage and where are the consumers going, etc. Um, so to bring all those things together to, to sanitize that data and, and what value it has, I guess um, Orkin is a good example of sitting in the middle of that um, in terms of supporting very different uh, rights uh, holders in this space. So could you tell us a little bit more about what kind of data you're managing, rather what kind of rights and what area of that is really driving your business? Yeah, definitely. Um, so predominantly we focus on digital platforms um, and the one that Cecile mentioned, uh, YouTube. Uh, that's really where we started and cut our teeth. Um, we work on behalf of a wide range of rights holders, major music, major labels, major publishers, CMOs, you know, independent labels, publishers. Um, we are processing, you know, these massive usage files, doing the, the claiming and the licensing on their behalf. Um, you know, as Cecile said, when you're doing multi-territory deals, you're, you know, processing 200 plus uh, files per, you know, per period. Um, you're having to, to license and, you know, claim the mechanical and per shares per song, per work, you know, accordingly, and then issue the invoices. It, it's a pretty um, significant process from a data, from a data process, data exchange aspect. So, you know, what, what we specialize is, is building technology. And I think what kind of our, our unique selling point is that we have uh, music industry domain experience and we have the ability to build technology to kind of solve problems for, for these rights holders that they face that are pretty unique to the music industry. So how would you describe the problem that you're there to solve? I mean, most technology is driven by that whole concept of where's the gap, what's the problem I'm trying to fix? But there seem a few there, but how would you nutshell it? Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest issues is that, you know, you're, you're processing data from, from many different parties and there's no standardization to that. So you have to figure out a way to kind of normalize and standardize that and, and you know for publishing for example you're all you're kind of playing catch up you know half the time the songs come out the splits aren't finalized you know it's not quite clear what's you know what the work picture looks like so you're you're constantly playing catch up in that respect and you know trying to claim as much as you can um so really from you know from us it's a it's a the problems that we're solving are one is how do we normalize data to figure out you know to process it to accurately uh understand what's going on and then two you know how do we handle with certain the, at the scale and you know the volume uh, to do it in an efficient and, and uh, effective way. It's a pretty heady combination when we think of the scale involved. Um, thank you, Ju. And actually talking about um, going straight to scale, if you like, from almost a blank sheet of paper, um, how, how are you managing all of those uh, issues at the MLC there, um, Chris and Richard? Because obviously you're trying to almost create a standard to, to an extent, um, but I think maybe perhaps you, you're you looking at technology, you're looking at partners. How, how are you sort of setting the baseline, if you like, at the MLC? Or put it another yeah. way, or rather the person I put to Drew is the problem that you're trying to solve. Richard? Uh, sure, there are about three different uh, questions in there, so apologies if I yeah. probably <laughs> answered them out of order. You started with the question of scale and and, I very much hope this is not, well, uh, not an answer that I live to regret, but, um, you know, in, in, in terms of, you know, the, the, some of the other people have spoken about sort of the scale of uh, usage coming in from the digital service providers, and, and that's absolutely true. You know, we do get very large 
quantities of information, you know, from Spotify and iTunes and, and, and YouTube and so on. Um, but actually, for modern platforms, um, scale is not, you know, shouldn't be such a challenge. These things are very well parallelizable. Um, so, you know, the Spotify file runs alongside the Apple file, runs alongside the YouTube file, and it's quite, you know, it's relatively to sort of partition those things so long as you're running on a modern platform. And, you know, um, the advent of sort of cloud computing over the last two years has, has in many ways reduced the sort of that sort of that complexity of scale, you know, with, with platforms like AWS, you, you know, I can have a hundred, a thousand servers stood up in 10 minutes. So um, in terms of compute power scale, um, you know, th that isn't, you know, in 2021, touch wood, uh, the challenge that it was 10 or 15 years ago when, you know, you were probably hosting servers in house and you were having to try and, you know, buy servers for your peak load and buy storage for your peak load. And that was a very, very expensive uh, and inefficient uh, sort of way of doing it. So in, in one way, that, that's one complexity of scale um, that I, I don't think is, is, is the challenge that it, it, once, uh, it once was. Um, Hopefully that addressed the question on scale. Um, I guess then there was the question about, you know, what challenges the MLC trying to solve? And, you know, um, you know, in, in, in the nutshell, sort of as, as, as I think Chris alluded to uh, at the beginning, you know, fundamentally our, our role is to collect, um, you know, all of the usage, uh, not quite all, materially all of the usage for um, digital audio streaming platforms in the US and some uh, download platforms in the US and, and pay that through to our members, whether those members be CMOs, publishers, songwriters, uh, or, or other entities, you know, such as estates, trusts, uh, things like that. So uh, yes, fundamentally to sort of act as that pivot point really between the you know the, the 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 users of digital audio content on on, on the one hand, and uh, the creators and the representative of representatives of creators uh, on the other hand. Um, I will admit, I I'm apologise. I've forgotten your first question, so uh, we can. No, well covered, well covered. Thank you, Richard. And I think there was there's sort of too much of a gap to fill there in the sense that the, the, this is all um, a new innovation in itself for the US. So you're also looking at the kind of controls and transparency that really wasn't there before so uh, I suppose you've got the vertical challenge in a sense there but really interested to hear from you Cecile as actually being in control of the rights themselves we, these guys are working with them um, making them work if you like making the, that, that connection with the usage um, and the revenues from them but for, for a company that an organization that is directly representing the rights yours and others whilst also innovating um, what is the sort of trajectory in that sense of development for SASM and how important are these tech innovations to, to, the, to the development uh, of SASM and where it wants to go? So, uh, um, uh, I guess my answer won't really surprise you. Of course, uh, tech is, I mean, uh, number one investment today in our organization. Um, to deal with this massive uh, amount of data to make the analysis of this, because if you want to run the, the business, if you want to better license, uh, you know, you have so many different uh, aspects in the licensing uh, agreement, the minimum per subscriber, the rate, uh, some rebates. So we, we, we want to really, if we have to move everything, you know, change everything, we want to see exactly what impact it will have uh, on our revenues. Um, it's true that what become key for me, uh, I mean, I used to work at Universal, not the publishing, uh, but uh, record. And uh, I was really frustrated when I joined SASM because, you know, there was this um, uh, usual speech about CMOs and, you know, nothing transparent, uh, you know, and, and, and I, I really wanted to fight against that. So when I designed new rights that our platform, the goal was really that um, our partners can get access to any of the different process, you know. So what has been declared by the DSP, what share has been claimed, and not only when they receive the, their, their statements, but even before they have a complete overview of all the process and transparency uh, all around the process. So I think that today, 
of course, we're talking about scalability. And uh, I understand uh, Richard, but uh, it's true that when uh, it comes uh, to two, more than two or three, uh, 250, 250 countries to manage and to have on top of the pure music platform, the general entertainment of YouTube. Uh, now we will have a TikTok. Of course, we already have Facebook. I mean, it really now represents a massive amount of data. Uh, we have to track all these different exploitations. So in terms of, you know, um, uh, intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, can we develop you know, new tools to better track our revenue and not only rely on all the reports, it's true that, uh, I mean, the explosion of the UGC forces to invest also in these tracking tools. Um, we have, of course, the blockchain. So, you know, we, we should uh, get paid one euro each time we say blockchain today because we'll be very rich <laughs> in one week. So, of course, we, we were super proud because we have invested in the blockchain technology uh, in now, uh, since now uh, three, three years or four years in our Elixir initiative with uh, PRS and ASCAP to match that match between uh, ISOCs and ISWC. I think that every day we have new uh, tech companies such as Orphium, but other one that propose a lot of new features. There will be a lot of them that won't be maybe uh, of interest for us, but you have to pay attention and that take a lot of time actually. You have to pay attention to everything to be sure that you're not going to miss something that will procure, you know, that will give to your members or your partners a level of services that they are expecting. So every day we receive new tech companies offers. Uh, we have, of course, uh, set up uh, now for three years an innovation department uh, that, you know, uh, look at all the different things available in the market. And, uh, and we work on that and uh, no doubt that uh, I'm sure we, we have to make some cost savings in certain uh, areas of the CMOs to be able to invest properly in the technology for the, last, for the next years. Well, thank you. And thank you for already answering some of the questions that have been raised. Um, and uh, thank you for those who put them in the Q&A there. Really looking at efficiencies, but also looking at exploring new technologies to, to, for their potential to help in that regard. And obviously blockchain has been through too many panels to, to take through this one, but it's useful in some ways and actually a very good example of where the music industry has too many nuances and perhaps too much scale in other aspects. Um, and I'm sure that although they were touched upon before, this panel is too short for me to go to down uh, the NFT warrant. So I'll save that one. But I'm really interested in, um, the, the point that you made about it allowing scale as well, how much time do you invest in investigating new technologies versus how much time do you actually invest in, if you like, improving the efficiencies that you have? Um, do you think that your direction will continue to look at innovation in the same level? Or do you think that you will actually sort of, that's so the same with more support expansion in a global or a user sense or a market sense more? Where do you think, think the most, direction most of them. is? Both has to both be both together. Of, of, yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, this, and, 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 and I'm looking forward as well, uh, and I, I'm sure a lot of uh, members that are attendees today of uh, better mutualization and cooperation between society. Because I mean, uh, tech, sometimes you can get super good solution for a cheap price, but uh, sometimes if you want very good technology, you have to pay, you know? And it's true that we all do the same processing when it comes especially for online. I mean, we all receive the same DSR. That, uh, I mean, uh, that's how we came to uh, the idea of Harmonia that was, you know, a joint licensing, uh, uh, not a, but a partnership. And of course, I did the same uh, to mutualize uh, the ingestion, the analysis. And, uh, and, but there is uh, many other areas where we can, uh, uh, I mean, provide services to our members. So of course there is something that is difficult in Europe compared to Chris and Richard's position is that we have a lot of competition for sure, because you can, uh, I mean, uh, leave SASM tomorrow, well, not tomorrow, but uh, at the end of the year, and, uh, and you, can join, you can join whatever you want, you know, that could be PRS, but that could be Orphium also, because now you have this new company uh, called IME, Independent Management Entity, 
uh, question to the uh, implementation of the European directive uh, about collective management. And uh, you will have um, more and more uh, new uh, society that will offer the same services and the CMO, maybe not in 100% of the areas because uh, traditional local broadcasting is still on a blanket license and uh, that will be very difficult for foreign company to deal directly with TF1 or France 2, you don't uh, even know. But, uh, but uh, for online, when you have to deal with international platform, I mean, uh, you know, Apple, Spotify, everybody know them. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a weird position when you, you have to cooperate to make cost savings for the benefit of the right holders. But in the other hand, you have to develop the best services to be, uh, you know, um, the best CMO to keep your members uh, and to attract new ones. So that's, you know, this balance we have to find. Yeah. I like that the competition is is up there with technology on uh, forming efficiencies in the market. Um, very healthy, very ironic, given the, the commercial landscape we're looking at sometimes. But in, in another point that uh, Cecilia made there, um, Chris, is, is about whether it's technology or it's a scale, you know, this is very much about the data and the, whatever's handling it, uh, we're only as good as the data that is put in. So. How are you trying to look at those efficiencies and are you working with other tech partners or what other processes to try and make that data really good? Pardon, I had my mute on. Um, one of the things that we're doing um, and that the law here really set up was um, not relying so much on technology um, that we are but also relying on the, the power of, of our membership. Uh, because our data um, is required to be made publicly available um, and because we cannot um, profit from the data, um, we manage it in a different way. And, um, and we encourage not only our members, but any songwriters to look at their data, to check their data, to communicate with their partners if they see issues with data. And I think over time that that will allow us to leverage a much broader group of people looking at the data um, who will be in the best position to know if the data is right. And when you, when you talk about scalability and, and Cecile was mentioning some of the statistics, yes, it's true, we're, we're dealing with billions and billions of rows of data. And yet in those billions of rows, um, you know, is a small set of data that relates to a person. And that person is probably really well positioned to know in an instant whether the data is right or not. So um, the whole dynamic created by our law here that requires us to make our data publicly available <clears throat> and the way that we've set up our system, which essentially allows members to drive the quality of the data by, by, by being the only ones who can change their own data. Um, I think that brings a crowdsourcing dynamic to our uh, endeavor that's quite interesting and, um, and over time will help. Um, but obviously at the same time, we're doing lots uh, from an analytical perspective behind the scenes um, to identify anomalies, discrepancies and, and the like. So it's it's that combination. I make that point though, because I think someone on the questions asked about, you know, will there ever be a single database? And and I think perhaps the, the question is better framed as will there be um, a time when there is more cooperation in sharing data and data is viewed less as a private resource or an asset that is to be hidden from the world and, and rather something that is freely shared. I think what you're seeing um, throughout the world is a trend toward sharing data more freely. I think ASCAP and BMI in, in the United States have done that with their SongView database. Again, our database is publicly available both from a search perspective and, and from the perspective that you can bulk download all of it. I think as there is more and more cooperation around the exchange of data, less hurdles um, in doing that, um, fewer people viewing that as an economic exchange, one that needs to be monetized and rather one that is done freely without charge. I think you'll see improvements in data. Very interesting. And interesting again to hear the word cooperation being right up there in the context um, of efficiencies. Um, I'd love to, to ask um, of him uh, as well, in, in a landscape that we deal in particularly, um, th that data is really fluid. Ownership is really fluid. Um, so 
then potentially an issue with blockchain, but I'm still moving on. Um, I wonder what your view as human technology um, and that sort of question of cooperation, what would really help your business in terms of the quality of that data? If you look further down the track, perhaps, as these conversations evolve, um, what, what would be the biggest boost, if you liked, driving what you're doing? I agree with Chris in that I think there's been a kind of fundamental shift from the rights holder standpoint to be more open with, with data and, and sharing it. Um, but at the same time, I think the, you know, there being, it's almost uh, the, kind of having one database is it, it's going the other direction, you know, rights are even more bifurcated now. So if you, you know, if you look at it, things are going more and more away from blanket licenses and, you know, so rights holders are, you know, uh, you know, for DSPs, for example, right there, you know, a CMO could represent, you know, one publisher for one, uh, DSP, but not another for uh, not on another DSP. So it's it's getting more fractured in that sense. Um, and one thing that we've been really focused on is is building a, a, a suite of products for CMOS. And it's uh, and Michael can speak to this better. But you know, just as a pro all these all the CMOS are essentially doing the same processes. And you know, there's I think there's a economies of scale for them to kind of opt in to work together. You know, you know, small especially smaller mid sized CMOS shouldn't have to repeat the exact same process. They should be able to kind of benefit and work together to, to, um, to collaborate. So that way it actually will help them from a cost perspective, from an efficiency uh, perspective. I think that's a, a big area where things could improve in the future. And that's one thing that we're really trying to, trying to put, uh, uh, provide is offer this end-to-end -end solution, uh, but it's also um, modular. So, you know, right now our CMO suite has nine standalone modules to kind of to cover each of the critical areas, but um, we can license that to a CMO in its it, as a full offering or, or just partial components if, if they only have certain needs. So choice in the market, but generally, so if you like sort of raising the bar of, of, of the baseline, I suppose, of, of what everyone is working with, which kind of leads me on slightly to one of the questions that's been raised. Um, about choice in the market and where, where publishers can be um, the full suite of creative services, just administrative service or acquisitional or, or not, or development, you know, the, the same is almost becoming true uh, with uh, PROs and CMOs by offering different aspects, different licensing models, um, some are SPVs, um, some are more national. Cecile, how do you, in talking of collaboration, I'm talking more now about competition. How do you attract members? Do, how much choice do members have of who they are members of? And where do you see uh, SSM particularly forging its advantage there? Oh, I think that really, to be honest, first of all, SSM is the best one in the world. No doubt about that. <laughs> I mean, see after, just no right surprise after. Answer. <laughs> no, um, I think that, um, I mean, there is competition, but the fact that uh, we have invested in services and uh, in technology has uh, allowed us to attract a lot of publishers that uh, usually uh, were working with uh, Anglo and American CMOs. So we are very proud of it. Um, we, we have more and more members that really see the difference between United States and Europe because there is big difference uh, and not only for the online but uh, even in the traditional uh, uh, you know you have ASCAP and BMI that are great societies and really as when I say that I really um, it, it's true but there is a constraint of the consent decrees which is totally different in Europe where for instance France it's a paradise on a legal point of view. There is no copyright tribunal. There is no decrease. We are totally free to, to negotiate in our, you know, in Europe. So it's true that um, that makes a difference. And we can see that usually, you know, um, when you were an American creators, European revenues was cherry on the cake. Now they really pay attention to the rest of the world. Not only the publisher that always have that in mind, but creators now, uh, so it's true that um, you were talking about, uh, we were talking about cooperation, mutualization, but there is uh, with the crisis that just happened and that is currently still here, 
I can say that I'm not so sure that there will be exactly the same numbers of CMOs in the coming five or 10 years, because uh, the growth of the online makes some repertoire super weak, to be honest. And now with the fragmentation and the fact that uh, big CMOs can directly manage 200 countries, uh, the traditional CMOs won't benefit anymore from the other repertoire in their country. And so they won't be able to invest and in, to the commission they used to take on the Anglo-American repertoire or on the SSM repertoire or the CIA repertoire they used to do. So there will be a, unfortunately, I, I might say because I, I have a lot of friends in, in, in different companies now, CMOs, but there will be a reduced numbers of CMOs, I think that will onboard the repertoire uh, that, that, that some society will be forced to mutualize, you know, their cost because they, 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 I think they, they won't be in a position to survive if they don't mutualize. So it's true that you can have some society mid-size coming with big one. You have a lot of small one, for instance, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, you know, you have a, a lot of small society that have decided to join to, to do their online licensing. Uh, but um, I think that now a lot of creators and even publisher are looking for a global solution. They don't want to have, you know, so different licensing scheme in different continent. And uh, we have to find with the competition, with the legal point of view, with all the different legal framework, because we don't have the same legislation in Europe, in the United States, in Latin America, but we have to find something that make more transparent uh, for the creators and the publisher, the revenues, uh, the flow of revenues, and, uh, and that will allow to speed the distribution as well. Um, I, I, Chris and his team just sent the, 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 the first reports for the, the revenue uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it, it's very fast, I think. Uh, I'm super happy that now in uh, next July uh, for uh, 200 countries, we will be able for some DSPs to distribute some months after the exploitation period. Uh, but I mean, it's challenging. And, uh, and I've heard that a lot of society, sometimes it took more than nine months or 12 months to distribute online revenues. I mean, which creators, it's impossible to wait for that long, you know, because they just need to, you know, eat, <laughs> that's all to live. Yeah. So we will, that will make difference. Again, we come to the efficiency point and in this really tough year that has been shown up uh, more than perhaps any other time. And if there is a, I suppose the positive of such a, a horrendous year is it's really driving that, that focus on efficiencies. Um, and you mentioned the MLC is obviously driving that forwards for the, for the US in such a great way. And you yourself as SSM have been looking at some really interesting work in um, uh, Arabic speaking territories, North Africa and the Gulf and, and further afield. And I know um, you guys at uh, Orpheum are looking at uh, the, the sort of rights management, if you like, the CMO PRO area in Europe. Um, are you able to tell us a little bit more about your interest there? Yeah, definitely. Um, we, as Cecile mentioned, we just became a, an RME, a client RME, which is the new CZAC membership type. Um, our, our company is kind of dual headquartered in, in Los Angeles and in Athens, Greece. Um, actually, our largest office is in Athens, we have, where our R&D department, um, we've got 150 engineers, product, um, data team sits there. Um, and the, 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 the CMO situation in Greece is, is pretty bad. It's the rights are split across uh, multiple CMOs. They, they, they can't figure out a way to collaborate. So, you know, we're pursuing a kind of a, an alternative solution there to unify the market and actually, you know, uh, bring the market back into uh, stability and, and hopefully growth in the near future. It's a, a very admirable and not at all easy mission, um, as I'm sure everyone around this screen will, will attest, but very interesting um, and very interesting combination of, of interest that you have there. And on that note of looking um, at, uh, the future. I'd like to just take a second for you all to, to think about, um, we talked about the big challenges, but I'd really like you to think about the big advantages that this combination of looking at efficiencies and technology um, and data management might have um, as we sort of run out of time, I'm afraid, in this sort of panel. But whilst I let you think about that, 
really like actually I'm not sure I'm supposed to do this but to turn to ICMP and answer one of the other questions that came up about um, you as collective representation um, how, how are you trying to influence and improve the, the, the state of efficiencies in this particular market for Channing? Yeah, thanks, Lucy. Just uh, reading one of the questions here. It's what what ICP is doing precisely on that and on transparency and efficiency. I mean, look at the bottom bottom line is that's our day to day work. It's our number one priority is driving uh, transparency. A, a few recent initiatives come to mind, of course. What Chris and, and Richard are talking about today with the Music Modernization Act. It's a unique thing that we have a, for the first time a transparent public interactive portal accessible. You know, that's that's an extraordinary development and it's it's not to be shirked so i think that's probably a precursor as to what we're going to see in many other markets and the fact that it's happening in the world's biggest one is um is there could be no better spearhead uh also at icmp uh we've launched most uh helped to support and launch the uh, globalized cue sheets project as well too through the society publisher forum that's a real game changer i mean having for the first time a harmonized cue sheet that applies not just to the digital environment but also across broadcast usage that means you're solving problems about transparency, efficiency, making sure that broadcasters in Japan using German music, going through a French society, all of those kinds of things are addressed by having a harmonized and standardized approach. Uh, a little plug there, but you can find an event specifically on that's Harmonized QCs project on our YouTube channel. Uh, and that's also very closely related to a lot of developments that we're trying to push in terms of automated content recognition technology making sure that it's not just metadata and manual input, uh, but in fact that actually uh, many of the different uh, vehicles on the marketplace for automated content recognition technology can recognize more accurately what's being used both in the broadcast and digital environment. Of course, we work with societies day in, day out. Um, but our main job uh, in really in this area is law reform and trade policy. And we're seeing a lot of transparency obligations built into big marketplaces. Everyone's heard about Article 17 and the value gap, but what a lot of people ignore about the Article 17 legislation is for the first time in history, there's an obligation upon all digital services to which Article 17 applies, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, an obligation to be transparent to all rights holders. That's extraordinary because anybody who has been through licensing scenarios and negotiations with these platforms know that that's just the start, getting around and seeing accurately what's happening within these platforms, getting good recognition and having transparency obligations back to rights holders, that's going to lead to uplift. And that Article 17 obligation is being implemented as we speak across Europe and indeed is being exported through trade policy into many other regions. So I think that's hugely important. And then of course, the companies themselves, day in, day out, will have seen announcements just this week from BMG who are now promising to make sure that they're expediting payments within 60 days, similar to what Cecilia was alluding to. So there's a huge amount happening here. I think the music industry across the board is more transparent, more efficient than ever. And it's our job at ICMP to support the industry, pan-industry initiatives, but also to ensure that in law, we're getting better obligations on services, both digital and broadcast. Thank you. And I know how much work um, you'll do at um, looking at sort of raising the bar, uh, as it were, uh, across the rights management landscape and where uh, rights management organisations may not be providing that efficiency or may not be perhaps uh, complying or adhering to, to the sort of various obligations of that transparency that you will raise that cause for the rest of us. And that's not to <laughs> anyone on this panel the impression that they're too under the spot um, from Johnny here, but you know, um, he is watching. Um, and that might answer some of the questions actually here that came up about uh, the costs applied, um, perhaps that's in, in terms of commissions. Uh, is that something that you look at as well at, at ICMP in terms of fees levied um, by rights management organizations, or is that sort of within the, the scope of things like the CRM directive? Yeah, that's more within the scope and what we're trying to do is improve standards and improve obligations, provide rights holders with sanctions in case of non-compliance. All of those kinds of things would be mainly the, the main things that ICMP is doing. I think the, the main benefit for ICMP members is that all of our mem all the members benefit if it's done in law. So it's not a service to service or CMO to rights holder approach. Um, but indeed, of course, we have to be very conscious of the marketplace and it's really up to CMOs themselves uh, to to drive efficiency and to make sure that they're making use of credible databases. To Chris's point, I couldn't agree more. The future isn't about a single uh, comprehensive database. It's about 
a number of comprehensive, credible, easily shared databases which cover the entire catalog. That's where the US has gone uh, and is going. I see supporting that as best we can. And that's, we're seeing that already with the European Commission uh, driving this, uh, trying to do something similar in, in the coming years. So that, that would be the focus of our work. Absolutely, and, and a lot of work um, it is too. Um, we talked a lot about the challenges. We talked about uh, the sort of uh, keeping to those uh, challenges and those standards from ICMP. Just in well, the last few minutes we will create uh, for this panel, I'd like to ask uh, each of you where you really think the advantages for publishers and songwriters uh, are, are going to be in the next couple of years, whether it's as questions have come up in terms of um, different forms of exploitation, like gaming or AV, for example, or is it different territories? Um, given all the efficiencies we've been talked about, I'd really be interested in your thoughts about the market in the future. Um, I'll start with you, Chris, if you don't mind. Sure. I think, I think as all of this improves, it, it actually frees up publishers and rights holders um, to do the thing that they do in the first instance, which is create more content and get more content out in the market. Um, just to frame it from a publisher's perspective, I, I think most publishers would agree that they would prefer to compete on the basis of their ability to um, elevate and cultivate creative talent, not on their ability to process data. So I, I think as, as we're able to drive improvements um, around the processing of royalties and data that frees up our members um, uh, and our rights holders to, to, to focus on the thing that drives the business in the first place. And that I think is good for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I don't think any some writer or music maker signs up for the spreadsheet. So, so it's on us guys, I'm afraid. So um, Drew and Michael, what's, what's the view from Orpheum about the, the next big advantages, if you like, for publishers and songwriters? I think, um... Kind of to echo what Chris was saying is you know more more options in terms of how how their works get licensed to these different uh, platforms. Um, you know not not so much on a blanket license, but there can be it's kind of more a la carte. You can kind of pick and choose you know which provider you want to do on a on a per licensee basis. Um, and also just I think the number of licensees is expanding. You know what we're seeing is you know really the big growth is kind of in the non, you know, traditional music service, the non 115 licensees, it's the fitness apps, it's the UGC platforms, the gaming, you know, that seems like a really interesting opportunity um, and where a lot of the growth is happening. Well, right. and a, a very open opportunity in my humble for the publishing space. Michael, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, I also believe that we, uh, all the interested parties in the music industry should eventually agree on all the standards through which they communicate data to each other, which will enable at some point uh, the normalization of uh, royalty flows uh, back and forth from the licensees to the licensors. So I believe, yes, that uh, using technology and agreeing, actually agreeing on the standards in the music industry is going to enable a better future for the rights holders. Fantastic. But at this point, we need an MVP. Amazing. And um, Cecile, and you, what's your vision on the horizon? I think that, um, I mean, the digital have um, allowed the creators from the world to have the worldwide as an audience. I mean, the world as an audience. So it's, a, it's a, an amazing opportunity where you have a BTS uh, becoming one of the most important acts uh, coming from Korea. You can see Middle East now, a big act. And, uh, but, but, all this exposure, all these audience must generate revenues for uh, the right holders. So we, we must really benefit from all the new technology available to better track and really ensure a better remuneration for uh, the artists and the creators. Uh, there is a lot of other topics we haven't uh, had time, unfortunately, to, to deal with, uh, such as a user-centric debate and all the new way to maybe pay the artist and, and, and uh, the creators and the publisher. I mean, there is a lot of things coming in the five years. So first of all, for all of us, it, uh, it means that uh, it's uh, an amazing period to, to deal with our uh, job. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. And there will be a lot of choice to do. And um, so we have to, to be care, careful. And, uh, and I think that uh, you can already set up a, 
a new uh, panel uh, in the coming months to to have a, you know uh, just uh, news about what what hap happened because now in three months or four months there is so many things happening and especially that have been accelerated uh, after the COVID you know crisis so a, absolutely a lot to come. Yeah, I mean, if you're like all of us here, probably really interested in the, the data and innovation it is a really exciting time. And that's what publishing is about. And when you mentioned BTS, they're so busy that they have to have avatars to represent them. So it really is all about the song um, now. But uh, I think I've overrun out of time, if that's such a thing. So sorry about that, Johnny. But um, unless you have other points or other questions that you've seen pop up, um, I'm just going to thank this fantastic panel for having me. Ms. Johnny. Can Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> uh, also, Lucy, uh, 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 I don't know if you can hear me. My internet connection is unstable here, but uh, I just wanted to also say a big thank you to Lucy, Lucy Caswell at UKNPA for a fantastic moderation. Such a complex area. Uh, we're going to be back here, no doubt, in a couple of couple of months to upgrade on on, on what we've discussed. Uh, but really, thanks also to Lucy, Chris, Richard, Cecile, Drew, Michael. Um, very valuable time. It's really great to have your expertise communicating so broadly to our membership. So thank you again. Uh, I also want to thank our ICD staff who work tirelessly to put together these events and that's not even really the day job. This is our lockdown adjustment. Uh, so for Amadena Velasco, for Oslin Magsoy, for Mark Kyle, uh, we all owe them a real debt of thanks for putting off such smooth and well-organized events and never mind the fact that they're always working on law and all of these other issues. So speaking of events, uh, we are going to be launching more digital series, um, but in the meantime, the next event for ICMP on the horizon is actually our Big Tent event. It's the AGM that's coming up on the 2nd of June. It's been a hell of a year for everyone in the music business, incredible amount of developments, incredible amount of challenges. And what we'll be doing is presenting and synopsizing those four ICMP members on the 2nd of June. Uh, pick your time zone, uh, applicable there. And uh, we look forward to seeing all our ICMP members there. Uh, you can contact the office via the secretariat details for the, for the uh, registration to that. And uh, we hope to see a good crowd. On that note, Thanks to everyone on the panel again, for everyone for attending, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.